good afternoon slash good evening. It is 5.42 p.m. on Tuesday, 10.10, October the 10th, 2023, and I am in the mood to ramble. I got upset today, believe it or not, I still get upset, but I say of suffering that the hook is made for catching fish, and once you have the fish, it is okay to put the hook away. And so the suffering is the hook, and the fish is the realization um, of the thing that you need to change sometimes. Um, in this case, the suffering made me reach out um, to some people in my community who can offer some, you know, emotional support or whatever, which, like, I still need that support, but at the same time, I'm happy. Um, I got happy before they got back to me. Uh, because I... Through, through all this practice that I do, um, I've begun to notice when I'm upset and know that there's something that can be done about it and that I don't have to be upset. Now, it doesn't, like, sure, I'd like to believe and I imagine that there is a point where I can reach perfect equanimity and, um, and that I can do it in this lifetime, and that I will do it in this lifetime, and that I will be completely unfuckwithable at some point. Um, yes. So hopefully, at that point, at some point, I will reach the point. I will get to the point where nothing can happen that takes away my my happiness, my presence, my. Um, my high, if you will, and I will get to this point, and I will say, you know, to whatever happens, you know, also, um, and more and more that is the case, but it's certainly not perfect, and, but the, the more dramatic, um, and noteworthy growth has come in how quickly I recognize that I've been caught in a trap. And the trap almost always looks the same. The trap is, oh, I am a person, and I'm this very specific person, and I have this very important thing that needs to happen, and it's not happening. And if you believe all of those links in the chain, then you're stuck. And so that's what was happening. It's like, I have, I am well, this person with this need, and this need is going unmet, and it's not right that this need should go unmet. And so, and I'm not going to get my needs met, and the universe hasn't taken care of me, and I'm upset, and I'm suffering, and I realized it, and, uh, how much to tell, how much to tell. It's not really that important. The, the, the specifics of it really aren't that important. The point is, you know, the landscape changed. I have a goal. Um, and to be honest, the only reason that I have this goal is because I tried doing nothing and it doesn't work. You, you can't. I, I exist to some, like, not the concept of I, but like this meat suit and personality structure and, and thoughts and, and emotions and, you know, cells cycling in a recognizable pattern commonly known as the Wolfman, it exists, and until it ceases to exist, passes from form, it's going to be doing something. Even, you know, laying completely still is doing something. There's no doing nothing. And also, there's no real reason behind what needs to be done, because it's all perfect and that can lead you into nihilism if you let it, or you can realize that we're in a sandbox and we can do whatever we want. Um, 
So it's not better to get enlightened than it is to remain confused. It's not better to get what, the, what you want than it is to not get what you want. And, and at the center of all of that, there doesn't even need to be a personality uh, that's getting what it wants or not getting what it wants. But in any event, there are choices that can be made. Um, I don't know if it's free will, because who who has the free will? This this ephemeral sense of self behind your eyes that you think is at the center of the processes of, of rising and falling away thoughts and of observations and of sensations. Does that have free will? I don't think so because I don't think it exists. I think it's a very, very well-crafted, clever illusion. A very intuitive, natural illusion to the illusion of self. But there, there exists, I believe there exists free will, but I don't have it because I don't exist. Um, so it's just... I think agency is better than control as far as a concept. Like, there's agency, you know, and just... The language doesn't really support the idea because... So I'm going to go back to saying I, but understand that I is shorthand and it doesn't really require a concept of self. But I have agency in that I just do whatever I want. Um... There are, there's conscious choice. Like I said, I was going to ramble. I didn't really have a point to any of this. I did suffer. I did suffer. Um, and I found something interesting about suffering. It's like, um, because if you watch my videos, I had that experience the other day of having all the suffering, past, present, and future removed from me. Hold. So I had a further conversation about about that um, today when I realized like when I am suffering um, I have always been suffering and I will always be suffering but when I am not suffering I have never suffered and I never will um, and so there are there are a few moments in the beginning, I, f I think for most people, there are very few moments where there is no suffering in the experience, but they do happen. And in those moments, it's sort of a, an eternal non-suffering. You, you, you're not suffering in that moment. And therefore somehow it's all still very paradoxical. And I think it has a lot to do with the fact that reality Objective reality is nothing like the perceived reality that we live in. Um, so, and somehow, in, in like, if you're in a linear paradigm and you're thinking about, you know, three dimensional space and linear time, this doesn't really make any sense. But if you realize, like, mul there's like multiple dimensions, there could be some something about objective reality that makes this. I can't explain it. Um, but I feel it to be true, all the same. That is, when you are suffering, you've always been suffering, you've always been suffering. And when you are not suffering, when you are truly pure without suffering, you have zero suffering in your experience, you're not suffering in the past, the present, or the future at that point. You are not suffering, you have never suffered, and you never will suffer. And because the, from, from a momentary perspective, the past and the future don't exist anyways, it's just as true that you've never suffered as it is that you have suffered. I mean, those are, those are, you may say that one is more true than the other, but they're, neither one of them is reality. They're both a memory of the past or like an, an either a true or a false memory of the past, but they're still not the thing. They're not real the way the present is. And you will never suffer this as true as you will suffer because it's the future, it's a fantasy, it's not real. So, again, words are just paint that we throw on the invisible man of truth. And so, you know, I'm, I'm just throwing words at it, trying to see if I, can, if I can get you to see the concept. 
um, the words are never the thing, and 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 so neither is the future ever the thing. The thing is the present, and um, old. So you may tell a true story about the future or a false story about the future, but in any event, it will not be real. It will be a story. Maybe true, maybe false. It won't be real in either, in either case. And so, and so I suffered today, and the reason that I suffered was because I had this goal, and the goal is to start the sanctuary projects. And briefly, one of my favorite quotes is, if you haven't been fed, be bred. And so I was looking at the world and not really liking what I was seeing very much, and I decided that if I could wave a magic wand and have every anything that I wanted, what I would want would be six months um, with my food, lodging, shelter, um, internet to provide it for, for me. Um, access to art supplies, access to therapy, access to events, drum circles, you know, things of that nature. Nothing that I had to do, but events that I could go to that were available and all of this. So, but but the, at the core of it is just six months of real rest where my food and shelter and clothing and, you know, basic necessities were provided for and I didn't have to work for six months so that I could think and figure out what it is that I really want to do. Um, and heal and, you know, just get off the fucking capitalist hamster wheel for a while. That's what I really want. And I said, all right, well, I don't believe that exists. However, if you haven't been fed, be bred. So I'm going to build a place. I'm going to call it the sanctuary. I'm going to, and the, the dream developed. And so I want to have at least four sanctuaries, three in the United States and one in Ecuador. And I want them to be places where, on scholarship basis, people can come and they can fucking hang out for six months. And I truly believe that out of that, like, depending on how damaged you are, the first six months may just be healing. But I truly believe that if you come back a second time, like, you're, you're fully healed and, like, you, you've gone out in the world and you come back to the sanctuary a second time... I think people are going to write their fucking concerto there. I think people are going to write books. I think people are going to like compose music. I think, I think we're going to create a world with more Chopin's in it, um, with these sanctuaries. And and um, the way that they're going to be funded is like we get these um, properties and we set them up really well so that they can be used for concert venues and like festival venues and have like our own events that we host that we will charge for and we will have our we will do concerts meditation and yoga retreats things of that nature that we will actually charge for um, and then we will also rent parts of the property out to festivals whatever um, you know the more tour wants to use it to throw you know as one of their stops like rent it out in that way and that's where the cash will come from and, and then that will feed the scholarship program where we take people who, you know, feel like they need to get off the wheel, would like to heal, or would like to, you know, work on their little vanity project, and be like, hey, how would you like to be a trust fund kid for six months, you know? And of course, I realized that, like, going from that back into the, the real world is going to be difficult, so we'll have, like, some integration counseling uh, beforehand and then like a phone number you can call like a sponsor type situation so you can call back so you're not just like kicked out of the nest like a baby bird you know but you actually get like a little bit of ongoing support coming out so reintegration and stuff like that so that's basically the dream that's the sanctuary dream and I'm on the wheel man I'm on the hamster wheel I'm, I'm working for somebody else to make money to bills so that I can have the things that I need to go to the job and it's, it's a whole thing hold so I live fairly modestly uh, and that leaves me and I've got a pretty pretty decent uh, paying job 
So that leaves me with the ability to support about one extra person other than myself. And so my partner doesn't have to work. So she can work on the um, sanctuary project full time. A lot of these ideas have come from her. Um, she's been, you know, at this point, the dream is so interwoven that like, I don't know uh, what stuff I came up with and what stuff she came up with. We both had kind of similar dreams when we met and we've been weaving this for the past six years. Well, the relationship has run its course. Um, so, it's run its course. And I, I, started, I started to think, well, you know, maybe I can be in this universal perspective and not be worried about myself and I'll be able to, you know, like just shine like the sun and help her out in whatever way she needs help. And immediately, when I was thinking that thought, I cracked my head on a, on a door frame of a car that I was working on. And I was like, got it! It was like the universe just smacking me. Like, no, you stupid monkey. Like, yes, there is a time and place for the cosmic perspective. Don't throw her out of your heart. Send her all your love. But, like, you're done. This relationship is done. paint her as the bad guy. I don't want to create any animus towards her. She's great. She's brilliant. I really hope she gets the help that she needs and she fucking goes on to do great things. Like, if she goes out and creates more sanctuaries by her, or with other people other than me, great. I don't need to be the one that creates these things. I'm still going to do it. But for a moment there, I was like, okay, I've lost my partner. I don't know how this sanctuary thing happens. I'm a very real person, a very specific identity, and I need to create this sanctuary, and I need my partner in order to do that, and I don't have my partner, therefore the sanctuary is not gonna happen, and it's all fucked. And so I suffered. And then, I didn't like suffering, so I said, how do you wanna feel? You know, and uh, I reached out to a couple of people, they both hit me back eventually, you know, and thank God for them. And I've thought about suicide, like, plenty, and I don't mean that in the alarming way. I mean, like, I've really given this concept some thought, like, as a philosopher, and I've determined that human life is very short, and... I want to die, I'll just wait. Um, and I think that most people commit suicide. One of the main ingredients of suicide is that people think that they have to do something in order to stay alive. And that may or may not be true. But if you're like, I would rather blow my brains out than fucking go to work another day, then just don't go to work and see what happens. You know, like all these things that you think that you have to do, you could just quit them instead of killing yourself. And that's basically the conclusion that I've come to is like, if I really want to kill myself, it's because I'm doing something, I'm forcing myself to do something that I don't actually have to do. I mean, maybe I'll have to do it eventually, but I don't have to do it right now. And so, like, if my job makes me want to kill myself, then I just won't go to work. It's like, how are you going to pay bills? Don't know. But better to not be able to pay bills than, than, than to be dead. And, like, if not going to the job results in my death eventually, well, okay, at least we tried. At least we tried, right? At least we tried. Like, what would happen if I didn't go to the job? At least we tried it. Instead of just being like, oh, I'll definitely die if I don't go to work. That's, that's crazy. You're quitting too hard. You're quitting too much too far. You don't need to quit all that. Just like, if the uniform they make you wear at work makes you want to kill yourself, wear your own clothes to work. What are they going to do? Fire you? Maybe. Maybe they will. Probably. Probably they will. Okay? They're going to have to pay you for that day that you showed up. You know? Like, it's okay to quit the, th the actual thing that's causing you to suffer. You don't have to do it. So, like, you don't even need to quit your job. Just quit the part of your job that you hate. 
if you hate being nice to customers, but you have to be nice to customers or they'll fire you, just quit being nice to customers. And then if they fire you, I'm pretty sure in most states you get better benefits. It's like, I want to kill myself. So it's like several steps removed from like we jump to killing ourselves. Some of us, the ones that actually commit suicide. Or, or addiction will eventually lead you to death, which is basically, to me, a death from addiction is like a type of suicide. It's like, you kinda knew you were gonna drink yourself to death eventually if you're drinking that much. And it's, it, it's, it comes from the same place, I think. So like, we're like, all right, so I wanna drink a fucking, in order to keep doing this thing that I hate doing, either I'm gonna blow my brains out so that I don't have to do it, or I'm gonna drink a half a gallon of vodka every night till I fucking have liver failure and die, which is just a slower version of the same thing. Several steps removed from that, you could go, okay, well, it's it's my job. It's my job that makes me wanna kill myself or makes me wanna slowly drink myself to death or smoke myself to death or whatever addiction you're pursuing um, or self-harm that you're pursuing. And so, quit the job. I'm like, but I don't know. I can't quit the job. Like, I have bills to pay and I don't have access to another job. Okay, well, there are other jobs so you can find those, but in the meantime, don't quit your job. What is it? It's not your whole job that you hate. It's nice to have an income source and something to do. Like, generally, people get bored. Boredom is one of the worst things that we experience. And so, you don't hate your whole job. You've decided that you hate your job, but like really you hate specific parts of your job. So what is it about the job that you hate? Like I said, talking nice to customers, wearing the uniform, these things will get you fired. Probably, but maybe not, you know? And so like, with, if you're in crisis, you can quit a little, right? You don't have to quit your whole life and you don't have to quit your whole job. You can just like, in this country, at least, they don't really control you. They think they do, they act like they do, and maybe they do in some weird, like, several step way control you. Like, they're, they're, you know, the food's locked up and you have to do some kind of a dance to get the food. You know, you gotta earn your, you gotta earn your money somehow or another. And so they have some, like, they have you under duress in some way, but they can't. They're, nobody's cracking whips in this country anymore. They can't make you put on the uniform. They can't make you be nice to the customers. So try it. Try quitting the job, part of your job that you hate and, and see if they fire you or not. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. Maybe you'll get enough rest that they come and they're like, all right, listen, you're getting written up. Like, oh no, you'll put it on a piece of paper that says I didn't do a thing that you wanted me to do. Right? Big whoop. It's, it's really not that big of a deal. Of course, I was in the military where if you don't do your job right, they can throw you in jail. And so that's, so ever since I've been out, the volume gets turned down a little bit on the punishments that you can actually get from, from your civilian jobs. But it's still, it remains true that like, if you really think about it logically, like getting written up is better than being dead. So, like, if your job is pushing you to kill yourself, then do the thing that'll get you written up. Fuck them. But I think I've said enough about that. The, the point is that people quit. When people kill themselves, they quit too hard. You could have quitted some... Quitted. You, you could have quit something less severely. It's generally that you're, you're making yourself do something that you don't want to do. And so... Give it up. Give it up. And let the chips fall where they may. That's my thought on suicide. And so... So people don't have to worry about me, right? I want you to check in on me because, like, I'm a human like everybody else and I need support. Like, I need a network. And I have a network. My sister's great. My parents are helping me out. I got a couple of really good friends in Jacksonville, a couple of really good friends in Lake City. Um... I have, I've been building a support network. I've been, I've been a rolling stone most of my adult life. And I have, based on that, you know, not really developed the deep friendships but until lately. And I do, I do have some, some roots here in Florida now. Um, and I got my parents, I got my, my brothers and sisters. And so, 
So I'm not in crisis, and if I was in crisis, I'd just give up a little bit. You know, I've just late. I've done it before. I did it when I was coming off of Adderall because I I wanted to die because that's what happens when you get dependent on a stimulant and you come off of it. You're no longer stimulated, and I wanted I wanted to die, and so I fucking laid in bed for four days, and I'm still here because I didn't kill myself. Like, I wanted to die, but I, I didn't. And that, that, was, that was when I really looked it in the face. It was when I was coming off of Adderall. Um, it was like a chemically induced depression. It was rough. Um, quitting stimulants is, is hard. <laughs> but worth it. And here I am now. And, and I'm suffering. Right, and so there's a bit of there's still these thoughts that come that pass through. Oh well, you could just kill yourself, and and then that would be that. But I don't I don't pay any attention to these thoughts anymore. I'm like, this is an echo. Like that's not what I'm doing. So if I want to die, I'll just wait. I've done it before, and it turns out if you wait long enough, you gotta get up and pee, you know? And then, like, like, ah, well, I wonder, I wonder what's going on. Get up, I guess, I kind of, I kind of actually would like to take a shower, you know? Kind of hungry, kind of would like to go get something to eat. And it turns out, like, a lot of it is just fatigue, and laying in bed for four days will cure it. Um, so if you want to quit, take a nap. Have a little, have a little nap. Take a little free sample of death. You know, just be, just be oblivious to the world for twenty minutes. It really helps. Hold. So, once I got done catastrophizing, I realized that like this little chain of suffering I had built around myself was made mostly of links that aren't true. Okay, so what has happened here? What has happened is I had a goal, because you have to, and I was pursuing that goal, and I kind of formed an identity, and, you know, I thought I thought there were certain things necessary to reach that goal, and some of those things were taken away. My partner, specifically, took herself away. And so, and so... And so what do you do? What do you do when the landscape changes and your map doesn't fucking uh, mean anything anymore? I go, okay. So I thought about it. Like, well, first of all, I don't want to feel this way. And what I do want to feel is calm. So I put on some music and my earphones while I was working. Because you got to still work. Because you don't know what's going to happen. And you got to keep them paychecks rolling in. So I'm still at work. I got my earphones in. And I got uh, some music with no, no vocals playing. You know, low stimulus. And I just say, calm. Use it as a mantra, right? Because I don't want to say I am calm because I don't believe that the concept of self is actually helpful. And I think... Well, if, if it's not an I that is calm, then how do I bring calm to, how do I experience it? One way you can do it is by, what would it be like to feel calm? And in response to that question, your imagination will imagine what it feels like to be calm, generally. Or, in my case, just say calm. And 108 is a magic number in sort of like India. I don't know if that's worth anything, but I figured as an experiment, I'd try saying calm 108 times. Well, I found that it was difficult to do, first of all, to keep track of. And so I'm like, I'm like, <sighs> calm. And then I'm just imagining the concept of calm. What does it mean? How does it feel? And so on. And then I'm like, one. And the numbers are throwing me. So eventually I, I realize, put the number first. When you're done imagining the concept of calm, then you go, 19. What was I doing? Oh, right. Calm. Tw 
20 calm and I did that so on and so forth for 108 repetitions I found that around 20 repetitions I was at peak calm and uh, then I lost count several times it became a little bit more difficult to focus and then around 100 I knew I was close to the end so my focus came back in and by 108 I was back down to almost peak calm if not at the same level of the peak and then at the end I was I was very very calm I'm like okay now from this place of extreme calm having just visualized and felt into and thought about the concept of calm 108 times with deep 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 breaths because each time it was <sighs> calm mm. Calm. Um, I'm very calm now. <laughs> I was like, all right, so what am I going to do now? You know, what am I going to do now? I could listen to music. I could continue on. I could think. Now, from a place of calm, it's easy to summon up feelings of love or joy or, or whatever. Um, all the jingles and jangles are out of my immune system or my uh, maybe my immune system but I meant my nervous system so I had a jingly jangly nervous system and then I did the calm 108 times and it worked so I think to myself well I could go further I could go for joy I could go for love I could go for satisfaction I could go for a sense of security these are all feelings that I can generate from a place of calm now that the jingles and jangles are out of my immune system I could listen to music. I could listen to podcasts. I'm, like, I'm going to go ahead. I think I'm in a pretty good place. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to listen to a podcast. Pull a podcast of a friend of mine. Just started a whole... Whole interaction. You know. Um, I reached out. I reached out for some support. And then I also started thinking about the sort of chain of of lies that I was creating my suffering with and I realized you know the landscape has changed see because it's a lot easier to think this through with a cool head it's hard to think it through while my nervous system was all jangly and jangly and so I realized that from a place of calm the fish was support like reach out for support so i reached out and i got support i got more support than i bargained for actually um thank god and thank all of god's children for helping me out but um then from that place of calm i was like i was like all right no now we're calm so let's examine why we were suffering in the first place what is the story that caused the suffering and i examined it and i was like okay so the story is that I am on the wheel and I can support one person and that person has betrayed me and we put all this investment in and they're not going to help me create the sanctuaries anymore. And so the sanctuaries aren't going to happen. Bullshit. Bullshit to all of it. Like sanctuaries are going to happen. The relationship was useful. Um, helped me hone the idea and you know I'm sure it was useful for her as well but I started taking it apart piece by piece and I'm like sometimes you will have a real catastrophe and the goals don't make sense anymore and you have to come up with new goals like I want to be an Olympic runner and you get your legs shot off and it's like well, if they allow you to use prosthetics, maybe, but if that's not allowed, then like you don't have legs. So that, that uh, goal of being an Olympic runner, you gotta come up with a new goal. It's not gonna work. Hold. This is not one of those cases though. Um, in this case, the goal still makes sense. I'm sticking to it. I'm creating these sanctuaries or I'm dying trying. Um, it's another thing that I've given up is I've given up failure. It's not one of the options. Um, I'm either going to succeed or I'm going to die trying. 
So, given up despair, <laughs> I've given up depression, I've given up, um, I've given up failure as a concept. It's like I try, and then it either succeeds or I continue to try. And so there are three. There, there used to be three options: failure, success, or death in the pursuit. Now, I've taken failure off the table. And so, it's, and it's all conceptual, right? Because again, if I get my leg shot off, then I'm, I'm going to take my goals of being a marathon runner and I'm going to repurpose them for something else. Um, but the concept of failure just doesn't, is not, I don't find it helpful. So I've decided that I'm going to, that, that I've decided that the sanctuaries can still happen. And so I'm still going to do it. Um, obviously, like, this is going to be... It wasn't going to be just the two of us. These these sanctuaries are going to be large operations. We're going to need, you know, probably hundreds of people on staff, if not over a thousand. Like, eventually, we're going to need a lot of people, more, way more than two. And so, like, the difference between a staff of 300 and two people and staff of 300 and one person. It's like, okay, so I needed 299 people, or 298 people, and now I need 299 people. It's not that big of a deal. Feels like a big deal when I was like, I was a couple and now I'm just one person. But you look at the size of the dream in the first place, it's like, yeah, man, we needed a, like a massive staff. We're an international organization. We were going to need lots of people. And so nothing really changes. The dream remains the same. <sighs> it's just the map. The landscape has shifted, and so the map doesn't fit anymore. And that's okay. This was not my, it was not my intention to talk about this, but here we are, you know. Uh, welcome to Rabbit Trails. So... So that's basically it. I suffered a little bit. And then I realized I didn't want to suffer. And I realized I had the tools and I didn't have to suffer. And so I, I worked my way out of it. And some of it comes down to building a network of people that support me, which takes work. That's one of the biggest lies of Hollywood is like... You see the guy, like, fucking drinking and not washing himself and, like, staying in bed and being depressed after a breakup. And then his friends come over and, like, make him get cleaned up and take him out. That doesn't happen unless you've built a network. Like, you, it may happen a little bit if you've put the effort in to build a network. But if you just want to crawl off in a corner and die, nobody's going to stop you. How would they? How would they know? Unless you're the person who's, like, initiating stuff all the time, if you just continue to be a loner, but now you're doing it as you're dying of depression in a corner, nobody knows. It's not their fault that they don't reach out. It's just Hollywood gives us this idea that if you get depressed and you stay in bed, your friends are going to come fucking save you, and they're not. They can't. They don't fucking know. So if you need help, you need to fucking reach out. Because... Um, Unless your pattern of behavior changes and somebody notices, which is like, maybe, if, you, if you've if you done good work building yourself a support system, then maybe somebody notices that you're not showing up. But for the most part, nobody's going to fucking notice. Okay? And that's not their fault. It's not that there's anything wrong with those people. You've got to reach out when you need help. Hold. I need to think. So, when you are suffering, if you have a practice, you will you will have tools to make your suffering go away. If you have a support network, you will have people that you can reach out to to help your suffering go away. So I would highly recommend building both of those things. Build yourself a practice that you can reach into to alleviate your suffering when it happens. 
build yourself a support network that you can reach into to alleviate your suffering when that kind of thing happens. Also, when you're suffering, realize that, like, no, you don't have to suffer, and you can jump into your practice, and you can reach out to your support network to alleviate the suffering, but if that's all you do, that may be bypass, which, like, why not? Why not bypass the pain? Fair enough. I get it. Like, bypass it. Get, get, get out of pain, by all means. But... One of the things that is the fish in the hook and fish uh, analogy is wisdom. And so every time you are suffering, there is wisdom. And so there is either something that you can mentally change about the way you view the world or something that you can literally physically change about your life so that you won't run into the same suffering again. Um, and of course, yeah, you can get, you can get, on some kind of a suffering treadmill where like you keep adjusting things and thinking that if you fix the outside world you'll be happy and no no you can be miserable in the best circumstances so you got to fix your inner world and your outer world because because really there's no you and there's no inside and no outside and so like to think that you can fix the inner world only is wrong and to think that you can fix the outer world only is wrong. If you ignore either one of those things, it's it's wrong. Because the, the separation between what's in here and out there is complete illusion. Um, based on our, like, nerve setup with our eyes and the way the perspective is, we feel like we're inside of our heads, right behind our eyes. And then, like, science comes to back us up a little bit and say, oh, yeah, your brain, that's the center of consciousness. Is it, is it though? Is there a center of consciousness? Or is like this whole experience, as far as the eye can see, is that where your consciousness is? You decide. <laughs> anyway. I don't think I've left any loose ends, but wrapping up loose ends is an indulgence anyway. This, this, this channel's called uh, Rabbit Trails for a reason. There is one thing that I wanted to say. I didn't say it in 42 minutes, so I'll say it now. And that is that um, when a tree is young, you put a fence around it to keep the cows from trampling it. This is a this is a, a quote or like a saying. I don't know who said it first, but it's out there. This isn't an original wolfmanism. Um, but when a tree is young, you put a fence around it to keep the cows from trampling. When the tree grows up. The cows can lean against it, and it's fine. So it is with boundaries and and spiritual development. And so, yes, if you're like guru level, and you find this out in the moment, you know, you may think, you may be fine. You may have like lots of cows lean up against you um, for a long time and be fine, and then like an elephant comes into your life, and you're like, oh, okay, well... Let's wait until I'm, let's put a fence around this, keep that elephant out, and then when I'm a redwood, then the fucking elephant can lean up against me. So it's not quite so linear. All, all analogies have their weaknesses. But basically, I've been seeing a lot of shit about boundaries lately, and there is a stage of spiritual development where boundaries are very, very important. And so if you need boundaries, have good boundaries. But eventually, eventually you want to take that fence down. Otherwise, the bark begins to grow into the fence and then the fence gets embedded in the tree. And I don't know what it's like to be a tree. I don't have current memory of that experience, but it seems like when I see a tree that's growing through a fence, it looks painful. And so I imagine at a certain point in your spiritual development, when you're like, I don't I don't need a boundary anymore with this type of person because, like, yeah, they're unreliable. I can trust them to be unreliable. Like, I'm fine. I have great faith in myself. I have great faith in the universe. And the fruit will out of this. Like, so if, like, if you're, like, 
if you're going at it too early, then your life will start to fall apart. You go, oh, like I'm spiritually developed and I don't, therefore I don't need boundaries. And then your life will start to fall apart. So it's like, yeah, nope, you still need boundaries. And there's, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with acorns. There's nothing wrong with saps, saplings. And there's nothing wrong with old oak trees. And there's nothing wrong with fallen trees that are decomposing back into the soil. This is all part of the cycle. So wherever you are is fine. But like there is a, there is a point where you don't know that you need boundaries yet. And then you get hurt and you know you need boundaries and then you put in the boundaries and then eventually you outgrow the boundaries and you don't need them anymore because you've like reached this like really cool peak of spiritual development, but it doesn't exist without all the other parts. It's not better, it just is. And so all I'm saying is like, if you didn't have boundaries and then you put in boundaries and now you're feeling pretty good What you're going for eventually is to remove the boundaries. But again, it's not so linear because like you might not need boundaries with the cows, but you might need boundaries with the elephants. And so I do think boundaries should be temporary. Yes, 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 yes. Boundaries should be temporary. It's like, I need a boundary with you right now because I am not stable enough to deal with your bullshit. But eventually I'm gonna grow into a person who can be okay, regardless of what you do. And so that's my little bit about boundaries. And I've, I've been all over the clock. Um, I know I talked a lot about suicide. I hope I didn't upset anybody. Um, but, something we need to think about. Death is common for all of us. And so if you if you're thinking about suicide, talk to somebody. But don't think that thinking about suicide is a bad thing. It's like if you've never thought about it, then when it's presented to you, how are you going to keep yourself from doing it? And so like when you're if you are feeling emotionally healthy, Think about suicide. Think about it when you're emotionally healthy. When you're like, I love life. You think, I love life. This is great. I want to do this forever. That's a great time to think about suicide. And like actually consider the topic. Um, and that will keep you from thinking it's a good idea when you feel worse. Because there's no such thing as a wave that's all peak and no trough. And so I have, I have talked about suicide... I'm not mad at anybody that does it, but I don't think, I don't think it's the solution. I don't think it's the solution. So, and if you are thinking about it, feel free to give me a call and I won't Baker Act you. I won't call your parents. I won't call your, you know, whoever it is that you don't want to know about it. Like they'll stay between us. I will advise against it, but I won't stop you. I'm not a fucking licensed psychotherapist. Um, should definitely seek therapy if that's what you're, if that's what you're thinking about. But I digress. So, I don't know. Like I thought about death for a long time. As anybody that follows me knows, like I try to remind everybody that death is the end of the story. Live a good life, live a bad life, fucking succeed, fail. We're all going to end up worm food. So, so when you think about that, it kind of takes the fucking, takes the piss and vinegar out of suicide. It's like, okay, this guy killed himself. What was going to happen if he didn't do that? Well, he's going to die. And so I don't worry about it too much. I think a lot of people get mad about suicide as sort of a, a defense mechanism. And they have to other the person that, that killed themselves so that they would be like, well, I would never do that. Eh, you're made of the same, you're made of the same stuff. You could, it's actually something you could do. Like you can take it off the table as an option 
But that doesn't mean it's like not physiologically possible. You certainly could. So, I, I could talk about suicide all day. It's one of my favorite pastimes. Um, I don't know, man. I've looked death in the face a few times. And it's like, all right, this is where I'm going. What difference does it really make? Well, the difference that it makes is, I don't know. I don't know what's around the corner. But I do know that death is inevitable. And so, again, with this I'll close. If I really want to die, I'll just wait. 